When you first got the part of Boise in Only Fools and Horses, did you yeah. realise you were on for something special? No, I didn't I, at all. I, um, I, you know, I'd been in a previous John Sullivan series, uh, Citizen Smith. He said he liked what I did. I played a sort of bent copper in, the, in that one. Um, and I said, well, that's very nice of you to say so, but I didn't, I didn't know anything else was going to happen. The following year, that I was busy flirting with America, right? Because I'd done a couple of plays in America, and I thought that's where the future lay. And and uh, I'd run out of money, so uh, I so I thought, oh well, I'll just do one more thing, and and that was it. It was an episode of the, in the first series of Only Fools and Horses, and it was just one scene, one day's filming. And when I got the script, I just it made me laugh in you know, a straight away, and I thought, oh, I really would like to do this part. And I did that, and it was funny, and I met David and Nick, and, uh, and so on. Nobody again, nobody said anything. Nobody said. Any, anything about the character continuing in the show. So I sort of forgot about it. In the following year, ooh, what was that? I suppose, um, I suppose I was at the National Theatre then, doing a play at the National Theatre, for heaven's sake. And they said, oh, come and do an, um, an episode in the second series of Only Fools and Horses. At this time, the character was featured quite heavily in, uh, in a show called Losing Streak. And uh, Boise had to play poker with Dale. Oh, I remember that one. You know, and it's just been shown quite a lot recently, I think, and um, a lot of people's favourite people's favourite shows. And then it went, then it went on, and the uh, third series came along, and would I do another episode? And I said, well, yeah, I'm having such a good time. It's such a funny show. Um, of course I will. And it grew from there. And it was uh, once in about 1985, I suppose, about the fourth year we'd done it. You thought, I mean, this really does look... Good. It looks like it's got legs, you know. A lot of people are coming up to you in the street and so on. And you thought, ooh, we're really onto something here. And luckily, of course, it went on all through the 80s, right up until a few gaps. But the last shows were 2001, which is 20 years. Amazing. Incredible. Fantastic show. And, yeah, one of the most successful TV shows ever. And there was even talk about them scrapping it at one point, wasn't there, after the first series? Yeah, that's right. I mean, cause he didn't, uh, the first series actually didn't do very well for those days. I mean, there were only three channels on the telly, and, and I think he did about six or seven million or something, you know, which today would be very good, but in those days it wasn't considered very good at all. And so they sort of put it on a, on the back shelf somewhere, and they'd forgotten about it. Uh, but then there was a strike at the BBC. They had to repeat stuff. So they thought, oh, we'll just put this out again, you know. And they put it out a different time, different place. The word of mouth had got around, and the figures went up by about two and a half million. And they thought, oh, hello, we want something. Perhaps we're going to do a second theory. So, I mean, it could, I don't know. I mean, no way of knowing, but it could have happened. But it might have got completely forgotten after that first series, which is an extraordinary thought, really. Yeah. You know, because it, it changed everybody's life, really. I mean, particularly the performance, you know. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing to be involved in. Very lucky, really. So what was it like to work with John Sullivan? What was he like to work with? Well, he was a great uh, perfectionist, John. I mean, he would work very often scripts were very late. And, you know, particularly when we were doing um, the, the early ones, the half-hour episodes. And I remember one uh, one time I was, I was doing one episode and um, the director said, to, uh, we were waiting for a scene. With the scene, with the scene in this episode, came sort of a few pages for the next episode, which, which we had to start doing the following week, because all the episodes were done in a week, you see. And he looked down and said, oh, well, Clarky, John, John, are you available next week? And, uh, and I was, he said, oh, thank God for that. <laughs> you know, because and suddenly, because he, nobody had said, oh, you're in the next week's episode, because the pages suddenly turned up during the week you were doing the previous episode. And, and that's how you knew. And sometimes, of course, people weren't available next week because they didn't know they had a job. And so so then the pages had to go back there to rewrite it. You know, but it was really sort of flying by the seat of our pants in a lot, in a lot of ways because John was, uh, as I say, a great perfectionist and, uh, and he wouldn't let us go until he got it absolutely right, which is admirable. And uh, he'd sit in on rehearsals and, uh, and change things during rehearsal as well. And he had a real sort of crackle to it you know, because of that sort of uncertainty the whole time, I think, anyway. What would you say is your favourite scene from Only Fools and Horses that you've been in? Oh, oh, well, God, that's so many of them. I suppose the seance scene in uh, Sickness and Wealth, that's what it was. Sitting around the table in a room at the top of the, um, on top of the pub. Yeah. And there's a seance. Dell's trying to reach his mother or something, and uh, Elsie Partridge, the medium, finds somebody else. Or, and there's a message for somebody called Aubrey, and... Um, and nobody knows who it is. And then uh, Boise says, I am here. And, uh, and that's how you find out what it is. Yeah, because so, he never would have said, would he? <laughs> no, no, no. No, no he says like to trigger, he said, yeah, well, you wouldn't say anything if, if that was your name, would you? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course not, no, Aubrey. 
<laughs> and the, uh, the Batman and Robin scene where uh, they stop the mugging and they, they think they're going to a fancy dress party and uh, Boise lets them in but doesn't tell them that the bloke whose party was supposed to be died that morning and it is now awake. Yeah. So he's full of mourners. And they burst and he shows them into the room dressed as Batman and Robin. Into this room. The boy he knows perfectly well and he knows what's going to happen and uh, he doesn't tell him. And, and if, um, if I remember rightly, he says the Joker, doesn't he? Yes, that's right. Yes, yeah, right. Del Boy says, um, yeah, look, 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 look at Boise. You know, we've come dressed as Batman and Robin and he's only come as the Penguin. <laughs> and Boise says, no, no, Del Boy, not the Penguin, more like the Joker. And, uh, and then he says, uh, he says the room's in there, and uh, it's just hilarious. A brilliant piece of uh, writing that. Love you, Karen. I know it's amazing. It's phenomenal, isn't it? The way it's it's lasted, and uh, and all generations seem to pick up on it. Um, it's extraordinary, really. And, uh, um, I was talking to some people today, and there's some who came along with a couple of young kids, you know, and. Uh, I mean, they're potty about it, absolutely potty about it. I mean, I said, oh, is it all, all those television shows? She said, no, no, it's only only full sources. You know, they really love the characters. And so it's, it's very good. We're very proud of it. That's what's great about it, though, isn't it? Because young kids like it, older people like it. It's really... Uh, yeah, so they all don't know. The whole families introduce, uh, introduce their kids to it, and then they grow up, and uh, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. What, what I love about it is because it's so funny one minute, and the next minute it's really serious, isn't it? Or, like, yes, yes, that's right. I mean, I, John Sullivan always wrote from the heart, you know, and he wrote about people's lives, and so I think that's why people can identify with it, because he, he's just right, he's a fact, he was a very strong family man, you know, and uh, and he knows what it is to sort of grow up the way he did in South London, and then uh, have his own family, and he was so proud. Um, one of the last times I spoke to him uh, before he died, uh, he just got his first grandchild, you know, and, and he was just, he just said, oh, God, compared with that, I mean, nothing matters, you know, it's just wonderful. He was so over the moon about it. Uh, it's wonderful. Hmm. So it's very sad, very sad that he, uh, he should go so early. Uh, still, he's left, uh, he's left a wonderful legacy behind, I think.